Welcome, Elam Chapel family, to our service together. Please remember to have communion elements ready to go, for we will share in the sacrament together later in the service. And now our call to worship is from Psalm 105, verses 1 to 11. Give praise to the Lord, proclaim His name, make known among the nations what He has done. Sing to Him, sing praise to Him, tell of all His wonderful acts. Glory in His holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Look to the Lord and His strength. Seek His face always. Remember the wonders He has done, His miracles and the judgments He pronounced. You, His servants, the descendants of Abraham, His chosen ones, the children of Jacob. He is the Lord our God. His judgments are in all the earth. He remembers His covenant forever the promise he made for a thousand generations, the covenant he made with Abraham, the oath he swore to Isaac. He confirmed it to Jacob as a decree, to Israel as an everlasting covenant. To you I will give the land of Canaan as the portion you will inherit. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
open the service this morning with a psalm praising God for his faithfulness. The evidence of God's faithfulness was seen in his, in his remembering and fulfilling the covenants he had made with the descendants of Abraham and Jacob. In verses 8 to 11, we read, He remembers his covenants forever, the promises he made for a thousand generations, the covenants he made with Abraham, the oath he swore to Isaac. He confirmed it to Jacob as a decree, to Israel as an everlasting covenant. To you I will give the land of Canaan as the portion you will inherit. What is this covenant that the Psalms speak of? What is a covenant? Discovering the answer to those questions is the topic of today's sermon. We've been looking at Old Testament stories for the last several months, and today we're focusing on the covenant that God made with the descendants of Abraham and Jacob at Mount Sinai, a story that begins in Exodus chapter 19. Most of you watching the service today know something about covets, covenants because they're woven into our lives, but you might have a difficult time articulating what a covenant is. The word covenant comes from Latin, convenere, meaning coming together. In the making of a covenant, two parties are bound together. There are covenants in the legal world, but you would want to ask a lawyer about those. My interest is in is in how the term is used in the Bible. First, I want to tell you that a biblical covenant is a little bit like a contract. Like many during this time of COVID restrictions, with no place to go, no place to go on holidays, we're doing home renovations. And this requires assistance. We've approached Jacob and Tia Moxham, who have a business with a lovely name, New Covenant Recreations. It's a great name for a company. It's actually a good title for today's sermon. We approached them last spring about a job. They gave us a quote. We signed a contract, a binding contract, one might say. Jacob came and he did the work. We were pleased. We paid him and the contract was done. Thanks, Jacob and Tia. And yet, a covenant is much more than a contract. More layers, more dimensions. Marriage is a covenant relationship and a good place to start when two people marry they enter into a covenant relationship. The marriage covenant is traditionally expressed in the vows that a husband and a wife make to one another. 21 years ago, Wendy and I were married and we declared our vows to each other saying something like this, I, John, take you, Wendy, to be my wedded wife, to have and to hold from this day forward, for better and for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health, to love and to cherish till death do us part, according to God's holy ordinances, and therefore I give to thee my troth, my pledge of fidelity. The traditional marriage vow outlining the shape of the covenant relationship of marriage is both realistic and bold. It boldly accepts the facts of life that life has its share of difficulties. And in that realistic view, it commits and makes promises that those difficulties shall not be allowed to break the bond of marriage, the covenant. This realism and this boldness are necessary because marriage is such an important covenant, important for a husband and wife, important for their family, and important for the well-being of the community. Healthy marriages make healthy community. You'd never put that sort of wording into a contract, however. There's another important point to make about the marriage covenant. In marriage, our identity changes. According to the marriage template in Genesis, repeated by Jesus, two people become one. Marriage changes them. A covenant like marriage is not negotiated as much as as it is accepted as a good thing to enter into. This morning, our focus will be on the covenant that God made with the Israelites in the wilderness of Sinai. It's sometimes referred to as the Mosaic Covenant. I'll stick to one name, just the Sinai Covenant. We begin our exploration of this covenant in Exodus 19. Three months after leaving Egypt, the Israelites entered the wilderness of Sinai and set up camp at the base of the mountain. Moses then ascended the mountain 
and met with God who said to him, This is what you are to say to the descendants of Jacob and what you are to tell the people of Israel. You yourselves have seen what I did to Egypt and how I carried you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all nations you will be my treasured possession. Although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words you are to speak to the Israelites, Exodus 19, 4-6. Archaeologists have discovered many examples from the time of the Exodus of covenants made between kings and their subjects. It was never a matter of negotiation, but of the king laying down the terms of the covenants, identifying the relationship between himself and his subjects, outlining the benefits of that relationship, and the requirements and responsibilities of both parties. By means of this covenant, a bond was created between the two, the king and his subjects. This pattern fits what we see in Exodus. God is the initiator of the covenant. He lays down the terms of the covenant. Israel's job is to accept the covenant and to live up to its terms. On Mount Sinai, a mountain aflame with the glory of God, Israel was invited into this new covenant with God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And in this covenant, Israel is, issued a, is offered a new identity. They will be changed by the covenant. Who and what they are will change. They will have a new relationship with God that will change their identity. Then they will have new responsibilities, new terms or conditions of this new covenant. And if they follow these instructions, they will have new rewards, new benefits. All this is summarized in Exodus 19, verses 4 to 6, where we hear God say, You yourselves have seen what I did to Egypt, and how I carried you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all nations you will be my treasured possession. Although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words you are to speak to the Israelites. They have a new identity based on a new relationship. In Egypt they were slaves, assigned a difficult manual labor. labor. They belonged to Pharaoh, his to be used as tools for his building projects. Their lives were miserable. But as a result of this new covenant that God makes with them, they will have a new identity. They will be God's treasured possession. He will love them with everlasting love. They have a new responsibility, though, though with the covenant. Uh, their job is to obey God and to reshape their lives around this new covenant relationship and its expectations. It's clearly stated in verse 5, Obey me fully and keep my, my covenant, says the Lord. God says, if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then you will be, and this is the critical point, there are always responsibilities attached to the covenant. They will enjoy the benefits of the covenant only by living in compliance with the terms of the covenant. The benefits? They will have a wonderful role to play in the world. They will be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. They will serve God, and in that they will become a blessing to the world around them. All they need to do is make this covenant work, is to obey God and to keep the terms of the covenant. So what are the terms of the covenant? Israel's responsibilities to the covenant relationships are spelled out in the rest of the book of Exodus, throughout Leviticus, Deuteronomy, uh, numbers in Deuteronomy. It involved instructions about their worship, their lifestyle, and their regular interactions with each other. There's a lot of detailed information in those books about the requirements of the covenant. But for the Israelites and those of us who appreciate, appreciate things like Cole's notes, there's a summary statement of these covenant requirements, and it was written by God in two tablets of stone which he gave to Moses. We know these as the Ten Commandments, or sometimes we call it the Decalogue, the Ten Words. Many of us memorize them as children. At home, in Sunday school, I memorized them years ago in vacation Bible school. Uh, but I wonder how many of the Ten Commandments we can actually remember today. Let's see what 
we can recall. Don't Google it yet, please. Uh, stay away from your phone. How many of the Ten Commandments begin with the words, You shall not, or thou shalt not? All? Half? Seventy percent? Well, if you said eight, you're right. Eight times we hear the words, you shall not. Two times we hear the positive statement, you shall. Obviously, the Ten Commandments are weighted toward what we should not do. They are there to promote our well-being and to make our lives better by living in compliance with God's will. But God didn't start with rules, actually. He started with a statement uh, a reminder that it's God's merciful intervention in our lives that is making all this happen. Look at verse 6. He starts the Ten Commandments saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. If it weren't for God's intervention, they'd still belong to Pharaoh. They'd still be making bricks. Now God invites them into a new relationship with him, a relationship that would lead both to their rescue and to their transformation. It's God's covenant. It's God's initiative. It's God's grace and mercy at work in their lives. They didn't deserve this mercy, but this is what God granted them. Now, with that firmly in our minds, let's get back to testing our memories. What are these Ten Commandments? Commandment number one. What is the first? Now, if we were at Elam, you could talk back to me and tell me. Uh, if I were tech savvy, you could text me your answers, but uh, alas, we have neither. The first commitment is, or commandment is, you shall have no other gods before me. Verse 7, no other gods. Commandment 2, you shall not make for yourselves an image in the form of anything in heaven above or on earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God punishing the children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. So the second commandment, no images, no idols. Commandment number three, thou shalt not take the Lord's name in vain. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. Verse 11. Commandment four, ah, maybe you get this one. Observe the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. As the Lord your God has commanded you, six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you nor your son or daughter, nor your male or female servant, nor your ox, your donkey, any of your animals. Remember that you were slaves in Egypt and that the Lord your God brought you out of there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord your God has commanded you to observe the Sabbath. Number five, honor your father and mother as the Lord your God has commanded you so that you may live long and that it may go well with you in the land the Lord your God has given you. Verse 16. Commandment six, Thou shalt not kill. Or in our newer versions, you shall not murder. Commandment seven. You shall not commit adultery. Commandment eight. You shall not steal. Commandment nine. You shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. Commandment ten. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife. You shall not set your desire on your neighbor's house or land, his male or female servants, his ox or donkey, or anything belongs, that belongs to your neighbor. So how did you do? Did you remember most of them? Did you get them in the right order? It's not that easy sometimes as it was, our memories get older. So what's so important about these c commandments? Aren't they a bit of archaic legalism? Martin Luther said, that anyone who knows the Ten Commandments perfectly knows the entire Scripture. That's a pretty bold statement, but then again, Martin Luther was a pretty bold individual. What I want us to note today is that at the heart of this story is the fact that God was using this covenant and these commandments 
to reshape the identity and behavior of his people. Or to make my point another way, keeping these commandments helps us become transformed to be the people God wants us to be. Now let's review some of the stories that we've heard in recent sermons. Joseph, next to last of Jacob's sons, was sold into slavery and ended up in Egypt where he became second in command only to Pharaoh. During a time of widespread drought and famine, the rest of the family moved to Egypt and joined Joseph there. But eventually, after Joseph had died and Pharaoh had died and other people came along, they forgot that story and they made the Israelites slaves, doing manual labor on large construction projects. Moses was appointed by God to be his man to lead them out of slavery. And this is the request he was to deliver to Pharaoh. Interesting request. The Lord, the God of the Hebrews, has met with us. Let us take a three-day journey into the wilderness to offer sacrifices to the Lord our God. However, as we read the story, that wasn't the plan at all. This trip wasn't just a weekend worship trip, a retreat, as it were, out to the country. But the real idea behind this request is, we're going to go for a hike into the wilderness, and after three days, we're going to keep on going. We're not coming back to Egypt. And yet, as the story unfolds, we see that worship truly was the reason for the exodus. It wasn't a false claim. They are going on the exodus into the wilderness to become worshipers. God's plan was much larger than freedom from Egypt. He was taking this nation of slaves and transforming them into a nation of worshipers. And he would use a new covenant to accomplish this. God was calling them to worship. God's plan was to create a nation of worshipers, a kingdom of priests. Now, there's much detail given to the Pentateuch about the rituals of worship down to the most minute details. But the bigger picture is found in the Decalogue again. The Ten Commandments show us what worship looks like. So let's review them again. There are more than just ten arbitrary rules. They are a template for living a life of worship. They help us become what we are, a kingdom of priests. Let's quickly go through them. Worshippers are determined to have no other gods than the one who has delivered us from slavery. That's no easy matter. There's always a multiplicity of little gods competing for our time and attention. Now, at the heart of the English word worship is worth. We worship things that are worthwhile, that are good. These false deities try to convince us that they are worthy of our time and our attention, leaving us very little time left to worship the God who has rescued us from slavery to what we used to rightly call in the old day the world, the flesh, and the devil. Number two, worshipers refuse the temptation to lean on idols. Anything or anyone who would be a replacement for God the God who has delivered us and the God who has set us free, the God who has revealed himself in the person of Jesus Christ. In other words, worshipers put their primary trust in God alone. Number three, worshipers are careful with the Lord's name. A starting point is to be careful just with our words and our conversation. Uh, You know, one of the dominant expressions today has become, oh my God. Worshipers err on the side of caution when using the word God or the name of God. But a greater danger is that which we sometimes see in politics of thinking that God is on our side. He's on the side of our party, our group. We don't dare politicize God or use him to advance our agenda. There's always the danger of that in our lives. That's another way of taking the Lord's name in vain. Worshippers don't do that. Number four, worshipers seek to maintain Sabbath practices. Uh, Part of that is going to church, taking time each week to consider what is truly holy and of ultimate worth and value. And And we dare not neglect our habits of gathering for corporate worship once the restrictions have been lifted from our lives. Sabbath is also about rest, and this is where I'm, I'm a bad Sabbath keeper. 
we're, we are invited to rest. We're commanded to rest on Sabbath. Six days God worked, on the seventh he rested. Six days we work, on the seventh we're supposed to rest. Worshippers learn to rest, learn to focus on God. Worshippers honor father and mother, respecting that these roles were created by God as a reflection of his role in our lives, because God is ultimately our loving father who cares for us and nurtures us and protects us. Now, with the sixth commandment, we move from our relationship with God to our relationship with the people around us. Worshippers don't murder. Well, that's easy enough for most of us. We, we never killed anyone. But Jesus expanded this deeply and widely in his talk on the Sermon on the Mount. Hear what he said in Matthew 5. You have heard that it was said to the people long ago, you shall not murder, and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says to a brother or sister, Raka, you fool, is answerable to the court. And anyone who says, you fool, will be in danger of the fire of hell. Think by Jesus' definition that there's considerable murder happening on social media platforms today. And sometimes we as Christians are part of that. Seven, worshipers are faithful to their spouse and to their family. They guard their family. They protect it. F fidelity is not only what we don't do. Fidelity is what we do. Being sensitive and caring for our family. Worshippers eight, number eight, they respect that which belongs to other people. They don't take what is not their own. That's sometimes a problem in the workplace. We sometimes take things, little things, that really aren't ours, thinking, well, it's just part of my job. Worshippers, number nine, speak truthfully about their neighbors. Carefully, honestly, not saying things that might not be true. Ten, worshipers are content with what they have. They don't covet what other people have, but they continually give thanks to God for his benevolence and generosity in their lives, what he has given us. Now, I've suggested that the Ten Commandments are sort of the Coles notes on how Christians should live and worship, but Jesus gave us a Coles notes version of the Ten Commandments, a little shorter one. Remember when he was in the temple and a scribe asked him of all the commandments, which is the greatest? Mark 12, 28. Jesus answered, The most important one is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and all of your mind, and with all of your strength. The second is this. Love your neighbor as yourselves. There is no command greater than these. Jesus appears to summarize the Ten Commandments with two. Love God, love your neighbor. And by the way, the word neighbor shows up four times in the Ten Commandments. We could easily spend ten weeks on these Ten Commandments, but that's not on our schedule. Our exploration of the Sinai Covenant reminds us that we are covenant people. That's who we have been, that's who we are now. We, we see ourselves as participants in a new covenant, and rightly so, for Jesus, by his death, instituted a new covenant. It's spoken of by the prophet Jeremiah in chapter 31. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and with the people of Judah. It will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt, because they broke my covenant, though I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. This is the covenant I will make with the people of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God, and they will be my people. Now Jesus, instituting the Lord's Supper, spoke of this new covenant, showing that it was in fact put into effect by his sacrificial death. And then he took bread and he gave thanks, and he broke it to them, he broke it, and he gave it to them, saying, This is my body, given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after cup, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. Luke twenty two, nineteen and twenty. Now what is important to note this morning is the continuity between the two covenants. In both the old and the new, the covenant is the basis for our being known as the people of God. In the old, 
we find this in Exodus 19.5. Now, if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all nations you will be my treasured possession. In the new, the words are spoken, I will be their God, they will be my people. In both covenants, we are made the people of God. We have a new identity. We are God's people. In both cases, covenants are worshiping people. In the old, we read, although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. What is the job of priests? To lead the people in worship. Our job is to lead each other in worship. The new covenant says, you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you would not receive mercy, but now you have received mercy. That's from 1 Peter chapter 2. As in the case of the Israelites, God wants to transform us from slaves into worshipers. We can be enslaved to so many things, our ambitions, the norms of our culture, the demands of our jobs, our bodies, our passions. To be worshipers, we need to keep our attention firmly fixed on God and on our Savior, Jesus Christ. Church helps us do that. And there's one thing in particular that for me is enormously helpful, and that's the Lord's Supper. The giving thanks to Jesus for his sacrifice on the cross that enables us to be covenant people. It's our custom to meet at the table of the Lord in Elam on the first Sunday of the month, and that is June 6th, the first Sunday of the month. I trust that you have bread and a cup ready for this most sacred act. We all come to this table in the same way. We come conscious of our need for the transforming and cleansing work of God in our lives, for the work of the Spirit to transform us and to make us like Jesus. And we also come thankfully, thankful to God, to God for what he's done for us through Jesus, our Savior. We come to this table in humility and reverence. Jesus calls us to this table. We respond. There are mysteries in what Jesus did for us, for us on the cross that we will never really fully understand until we get to heaven. And there are mysteries in this act of eating and drinking together that cannot be explained. We only do it in accepting faith. We take and eat and drink saying, Yes, Lord, I believe. These are the words that Paul gave us, the words of institution for the Lord's Supper. On the night he was handed over to suffering and death, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread, and when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his, to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. These are the truths that we affirm in our eating and drinking. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, in an upper room where you first gave your disciples bread and wine, saying, This is my body, this is my blood, you first prayed over them with thanksgiving. In your prayer you took ordinary things and consecrated them, making them sacred and holy. We thank you for this, for we believe that in your prayer you consecrated every piece of bread and every cup that we offer to you as a thanksgiving. We receive this bread and this cup with thanksgiving to you, and we pray that your Spirit will truly help us to remember your sacrifice on the cross and our adoption into your family and our establishment in the new covenant. Amen. In thanksgiving to God for the sacrificial death of Jesus Christ, our Son, let us eat together. And in thanksgiving to God for the cleansing power of the blood of Jesus, let us drink together.
Lord Jesus, may this time of fellowship with you around this table strengthen us and equip us for this week ahead that we might live our lives as people who belong to you and that we might live our lives in such a way that worships you and honors you. Through the glory of your name, Jesus, we pray and make this request. Amen. Let's join with Kim in singing our closing hymn.